Hello, I'm Tony Perkins with Washington Watch. Each day, this program provides a biblical perspective on news, including insightful interviews with elected leaders, newsmakers, and cultural experts. I want to thank you for joining us today. We have a great program coming up, but first, here are some headlines from our friends with FISM News. For FISM News, I'm Samuel Case with your Washington Watch News update for Friday, April 19th. Well, we of course start with the big news of the day, and that is Israel has finally struck back against Iran. Early this morning, Israel conducted a limited strike inside Iran nearly a week since Iran's unprecedented missile and drone attack on Saturday. Now, according to reports, Israel struck military targets near the city of Isfahan, which is home to Iran's largest nuclear research facility. And it's believed Israel struck near an Iranian air base, though the full extent of that damage is is still unknown. The Times of Israel does suggest they were targeting an air defense radar system that was located in the area. Meanwhile, that attack came only hours after Iran's foreign minister warned the country would bring, in his words, maximum retaliation should Israel attack. In case the Israeli regime embarks on adventurism again and takes action against the interests of Iran, the next response from us will be immediate and at a maximum level. But now Iran isn't sounding so tough. According to the New York Times, Iranian state media has described Israel's strike as, quote, not a big deal. And in fact, Iran is trying to downplay or even deny Israel's responsibility altogether, perhaps in hopes of avoiding further escalation. Meanwhile, back here in the U.S., Speaker Johnson is defying calls to up the threshold of votes needed to vacate the speakership, even though that might cost him his own job. Currently, it only takes one member to bring a motion to vacate. That's a rule made as part of a deal between former Speaker Kevin McCarthy and hardline Republicans. Johnson says the rule has, in fact, harmed the Republican majority, but says any rule change requires a majority of the full House. Meanwhile, Johnson says he's actually not worried worried about losing his job. My, my philosophy is you, you do the right thing and you let the chips fall where they may. I, I don't, I, if I operated uh, out of fear over a motion to vacate, I would never be able to do my job. I, I, look, history judges us for what we do. This is a critical time right now, a critical time on the world stage. I, I could make a, you know, I, I could make a selfish decision and, and, and do something that, um, th 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 that's different, but I, I'm doing here what I believe to be the right thing. This comes as Representatives Marjorie Taylor Greene, Thomas Massey, and now Paul Gosar are threatening to oust Johnson for pursuing Ukraine funding without additional provisions for the border. Um, I think pr providing lethal aid to Ukraine right now is critically important. And I'm going to allow an opportunity for every single member of the House to vote their conscience and their will on this. And I think that's the way this institution is supposed to work. And I'm willing to take personal risk for that because we have to do the right thing and history will judge us. House Democrats helped Johnson move forward with a foreign aid package earlier today, setting up a final vote for tomorrow. And finally, all 12 jurors have been seated for Trump's hush money trial, defying expectations of a multi-week selection process. Alternate jurors still need to be selected, but uh, Judge Juan Merchant says opening arguments could begin as soon as Monday. Meanwhile, the former president, he continues to rail against the case as election interference. The whole world is watching this hoax. You got a DA that's out of control. You have a judge that's highly conflicted. The whole thing is a mess, and you have the leading candidate and leading crooked Joe Biden by law. He's the one that should be in trouble. He's a crook. You got a crooked president. We'll have to see what happens on Monday. And with that, those are today's headlines from FISM News. Once again, I'm Samuel Case. And don't forget, as always, you can catch our full show tonight. That'll be at 5 p.m. Eastern time on FISMnews.tv. Again, the website is FISMnews.tv. We'll be covering these stories and so much more. You don't want to miss it. You can also find us on social media. We're on all the major platforms. And you can also download the FISM app right to your smartphone. All right, now stay tuned for watching. Washington Watch with Tony Perkins, and I'll see you again on Monday with much more news.
the heart of our nation's capital. Here's Family Research Council President Tony Perkins. Friday and welcome to Washington Watch. My name is Joseph Backholm. I'm a senior fellow for Biblical Worldview here at Family Research Council. It's my pleasure to be sitting in for Tony today and with you. We're going to cover, among other things, Israel on the show today. But before we get to our news items, I want to remind you of an effort taking place here at Family Research Council. We are calling believers to commit to praying for and standing with Israel and for Bible-believing churches to do so collectively on Sunday, May 19th, by dedicating a portion of their worship services to pray for Israel's peace, prosperity, and protection. To learn more about this effort and to sign the pledge, visit PrayAndStand.com or text the word Israel to 67742. That's Israel, I-S-R-A-E-L, to 67742 to participate in this, in this important effort. Uh, today on the program, as I just mentioned, Israel has responded to Iran's strike against them. Was it enough? Will it lead to more aggression directly from Iran? We'll talk about that today. In addition, the Biden administration has released new Title IX rules that impact education and gender and a number of LGBT-related policies. But one of the most surprising things about these new rules may be what they did not do. We'll tell you more about that coming up later in the program. Also, David Clausen from the Center for Biblical Worldview will stop by to talk about why Democrats do a better job of passing on their political values to their children than Republicans do. Important worldview things to understand that we will cover later in the program. But first, our headline for today. A lot of action on Capitol Hill this morning as the House of Representatives advanced multiple foreign aid packages for international allies setting up floor votes for tomorrow. The reality here is that if the House did not do this better policy and process, allowing for amendments on the floor uh, in, in the process tomorrow, uh, we would have had to eat the Senate supplemental bill. And that is because we were very close, given the timeline of both uh, Israel and Ukraine, to a discharge petition being brought. And a discharge petition in layman's terms is that when uh, a number of members or a majority of members get together, they can override the speaker and bring something straight to the floor. That would have happened imminently on the Senate supplemental. That was House Speaker Mike Johnson speaking to reporters earlier today. We'll go now to Washington Watch reporter Victoria Marshall for a quick update. Victoria, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Joseph. Now, tell us more. We heard there from uh, Speaker Johnson, but uh, what was your take about what happened on the Hill today? Yes, definitely. So this morning, the House voted in favor of the rule that will allow them to bring the $95 billion foreign aid, aid package to the House floor for a vote. Um, what was significant about it is that the Democrats actually joined Republicans in voting in favor of the bill. Normally, rule votes are typically party-line votes, and so it was a, a bipartisan um, a vote. Uh, so now Mike Johnson will be able to tomorrow uh, bring his separate foreign aid bills, Israel, Taiwan, uh, Ukraine, to the House floor for a vote. And because Democrats supported it this morning, those bills will most likely pass. Now, because there are multiple conflicts, unfortunately, in the globe, we do have these multiple aid packages. We're looking at uh, Ukraine, looking at Israel, also uh, talking about Taiwan as well and the threat from China. Do you have a, an idea of how much support there is for each of these efforts? Is there general support for the aid packages? Is one aid package uh, likely to progress while others may not? Well, I mean, just because the aid package passed the House, uh, or the rule passed the House, uh, Democrats, uh, they, they wouldn't have passed without the Democrats' uh, Democratic support. So there is enough uh, support among Democrats and Republicans to pass both of those bills. Um, the White House is in favor of this package. So uh, the, the Democrats uh, really care about funding Ukraine, uh, as well as a lot of the moderate Republicans. Uh, same with Israel. So I don't expect them not to pass tomorrow, just because of uh, the, how the rule um, was successful this morning. 
So is it your expectation as they work over the weekend, and they will be working over the weekend on these packages, that all of them will pass with some ver some form of bipartisan support? Yes. Well, we will be excited to follow that over the weekend. And, and certainly, one of the things that would be interesting to track, uh, if there is Democrat support for this, how this plays in the Republican caucus that uh, Speaker Johnson continues to try to hold together. Uh, lots of political ramifications for him personally, and certainly for the caucus as well as they head into uh, November. Victoria, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me, Joseph. As I mentioned earlier, the Israeli military launched a counterattack against Iran this morning, striking a military base near the city of Isfahan. The attack marks Israel's first military response to Iran's largely ineffective missile and drone barrage last weekend. The reportedly small scale of Israel's attack has many asking if both sides are seeking to de-escalate the conflict. Joining me now from Jerusalem with an update is CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell. Chris, welcome back to Washington Watch. Great to be with you, Joseph. Well, Chris, what's the mood on the ground hours after this uh, response from Israel to Iran's attack? Well, Joseph, I would say a bit of relief right now. Uh, Israel has gone ahead and uh, responded to what happened just about a week ago, a historic large probably the largest in history, uh, the uh, 350 projectiles, cruise missiles, drones, suicide drones, uh, as well as ballistic missiles. So Israel, everybody here knew that Israel had to respond somehow. And the way it has seems to be measured, uh, seems to be sending a message that Israel can't allow Iran to strike at Israel without some sort of response. And But uh, it seemed to be calculated in such a way, Joseph, that uh, that it wouldn't put Iran in a save, uh, losing face, and it wouldn't be uh, put Iran in a position that it would have to respond. So both nations, I think, Israel and Iran, feel like uh, maybe this is the the end of this particular round. And I would say cautiously. Uh, but w one other thing that's been noted over here, Joseph, is that for the first time in 45 years, there's been a shadow war between Israel and Iran last week. That war became into the light and out of the shadows, uh, and now Israel's responding. They've crossed some sort of a Rubicon. What it looks like going forward, we'll have to wait in the next few days, weeks, and months. And I want you to say a bit more about that shadow war. As you mentioned, Iran has been operating against Israel large, largely through Hamas and Hezbollah. I understand 90 percent of their funding comes from Iran. So they've been engaging in this for a while. What is the significance, do you think, of the fact that Iran finally decided to launch a direct assault from their home territory against Iran, or against Israel, rather? Well, obviously, uh, the pretext seemed to be on, on April 1st, when uh, presumably or reportedly Israel attacked a consulate that really was more of a military base there in uh, Damascus, uh, feeling they had to respond somehow. They responded, and some people think might have been a strategic blunder. Because uh, and what some people over here, Joseph, are calling a miracle, 99 percent of those uh, projectiles, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles and suicide drones were shot out of the air, either by F-35s, F-16s and F-15s, as well as uh, uh, the Arrow 3, the Iron Dome and David Sling. Uh, so for whatever reason, Iran decided that it had to respond uh, to that attack on April 1st. But it really kind of exposed some of its weaknesses. Uh, and it, it also s served to show the strength of uh, I Israel's uh, anti-missile defenses as well as the cooperation between many nations here in the region, including Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Jordan, as well as Western allies like France, uh, the UK, and of course, uh, the United States. And that coalition really seemed to be uh, blunt, this, uh, this historic attack by Iran just about a week ago. Yeah. Now it seems, based on Israel's response and the way they chose to respond, uh, that they are okay with de-escalating this. Uh, and it seems as well that Iran um, is going to be fine with that as well. But when we go back to that attack that Iran launched against Israel, 
Do you think they were surprised by how successfully Israel was able to neutralize their attack? Because presumably, uh, when you attack somebody, you, you don't attack somebody for the purpose of de-escalating something. But their state of mind right now seems to be, we're not looking for all-out war with Israel. So do you, is there any sense in which Iran kind of expected a uh, successful defense against their assault, and they just wanted to do this to kind of send a message? Well, you know, some people have postulated that, but uh, I think uh, a number of people here say it was actually 60 tons of explosives combined in all those ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and suicide drones. And that's a hard uh, sell if you're trying to actually have somebody defend against that. It could have been a disaster. And uh, as I said before, many people are considering what happened last week a miracle. Uh, people last Saturday night were expecting literally the apocalypse, uh, maybe some the beginning of World War III or regional war. Right. And by the morning, they were all deciding, well, do I go back to work or not? Uh, so it really was uh, a, an amazing display of defense. I, I would add to uh, as well, Joseph, that the message that Israel was sending today, I think, was twofold. First of all, uh, Iran cannot attack Israel, especially the way they did, without some sort some sort of response. And the other message was the attack came very close to an Iranian nuclear facility, uh, Isfahan, and Natanz is not too far away as well. And that sends a message to Iran that if Israel wants to attack their nuclear facilities, they can do that. In addition to that, Joseph, it seems like they penetrated what's called the S-300, which is a Russian uh, air defense system. And uh, it seems like Israel was able to penetrate that as well which sends another strategic message, not only to Iran, but the region as well. Well, meanwhile, Israel continues their war against Hamas in Gaza. Is the actions, the, the kind of interactions, the conflict with Israel recently having any impact on what Israel is doing strategically against Hamas? Exactly. And this is part of the message, too, it seems, uh, Joseph, that because the response was measured and did not uh, presumably so far provoke a regional conflict or a direct conflict between Israel and Iran, that right now Israel can go down into the Gaza Strip and eliminate perhaps the last Hamas stronghold in, uh, in the Gaza Strip in Rafah. Uh, and not only may perhaps eliminate or capture the leaders of Hamas, as well as perhaps rescue as many of the hostages they can. So I think there was a calculation. Israel, we don't necessarily want a major war with, Israel, uh, with Iran right now. We want to take care of uh, Hamas and the Gaza Strip, then maybe turn their attention to the north, to, uh, to Hezbollah. But I would add this, Joseph, your prayer for in May 19th is so needed. Prayer right now for Israel is, uh, is one of the main weapons of their spiritual iron dome that they need from Christians around the world. That's exactly right. And Chris, maybe in about 10 seconds, do you think their kind of uh, con constrained uh, response against Iran will affect the way the international community is looking at and treating Israel in their conflict against Hamas? Very much so. And I think that was part of the calculus as well. I think uh, the U.S. and Europe didn't want a major response. So I think that helped strengthen that international coalition on behalf of Israel. Chris Mitchell, thank you so much for your time. Great to be with you, Joseph. Coming up next, more from Israel, as well as further discussions of the aid legislation pending on Capitol Hill when I'm joined by Congressman Eric Burleson. We'll be back. scripture in the Bible is this scripture. 
John 15 and 5, Jesus speaking, for without me, you can do nothing. This is not about sucking it up. It's not about pulling up your bootstraps. It's about turning from this to something, someone, and his name is Jesus, who enables us and empowers us to be the men of God that he's called us to be. Brothers, listen to me. You have been endowed with authority from heaven to put your hand up against all of the forces of darkness that is coming against you and against your household. And if you will use that rightful authority, God himself will stand in back of it. God has given you, as the parent, as the father of your children, the responsibility and the authority to teach your children. You are not to outsource that to your wife or to your pastor. You are the spiritual leader of your home. You will never be faithful in serving your calling if you're not faithful in your family relationships. It just won't happen. I don't need entertainment. I don't need opinions. I don't need a soft message. I need the Bible. I came to hear the Word of God today. That's what we need today, the Word of God. America was a bright light until the culture gave into darkness. But we won't. We are in a battle for the soul of our nation, between right and wrong, between truth and lies. At a time when the mainstream media is blocking Americans from truth, millions are searching for a source of trustworthy news that shines a light in the darkness. At this time of great need, FRC is lighting the way forward. For 40 years, Family Research Council and its partners have stood together to advance and defend biblical truth in government and culture. Between our flagship broadcast program, Washington Watch, with Tony Perkins, to our news outlet, The Washington Stand, FRC is providing believers across the country with news they can trust from a biblical worldview. When you stand with FRC, you help light the way forward for America and the next generation. Go to frc.org slash give. Joseph back home sitting in for Tony today. Israel's retaliatory strike against Iran this morning occurred just hours before Congress advanced legislation to send aid to Israel along with Ukraine and Taiwan. Now you remember in 2023, the House of Representatives passed legislation to provide aid to Israel, which stalled in the Senate. Now what can we anticipate for this updated version of foreign aid legislation now scheduled for a vote in the House tomorrow? Joining me to discuss this is Congressman Eric Burleson, who recently returned from a trip to Israel. He serves on the House Oversight and Accountability Committee, the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and the Committee on Education and Workforce. He represents the 7th Congressional District of Missouri. Congressman Burleson, welcome back to the program. Hey, Joseph. Good to be back. Good to have you. What's your reaction to the developments in the Middle East and specifically uh, Israel's counterstrike against Iran? Yeah, I think that Israel uh, did a measured response. I think that it was designed to de-escalate, um, but but also to to make the statement that you're not gonna you're not gonna get away with attacking um, a, the, a sovereign nation like Israel. And I'm and I'm glad that they did, and that that they are demonstrating that they they have a right to be there. Now, you've recently been in Israel yourself. You've had conversations with the leadership there. You've seen the damage inflicted on the country by Hamas. Uh, what did you take from that experience? How is that informing what you think the United States should be doing in that situation? Yeah, I think that, look, as a Christian, I was able to go to you know the origin story of, of my faith. And and but I was, wouldn't have been able to do that if it was under um, control by the Palestinians or, or people of Gaza. This is because Israel is a it's a peaceful nation. It's a Western style democracy. They they support free speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, all of those things that we hold dear here in America. And because of and, but sadly that those values are hated by the by nations that uh, border Israel. Um, one of the things that I took away from the meeting was that whenever I we we toured a kibbutz, which is basically a community, uh, like a I call it a homeowners association on steroids, 
that was in southern Israel in on, on bordering on the Gaza Strip. And we went door to door and, and look, it, it was the most shocking experience of my life because I saw um, bullet holes, rid homes riddled with bullet holes, uh, home, the, the homes were burnt up. The, the photos of these families were there. You, you knew that they were either dead or, or kidnapped or, or, or worse. And it's just, uh, it was horrific. It was barbaric. And one of the things that was the most disturbing thing that I learned is that, that there were three waves that came in. The first wave was the elite guard of, of Hamas. Then the second wave was the rank and file military. And then the third wave was, were citizens, Palestinian citizens. You know, the, these are the people that are supposedly innocent, but they came in and they were the ones by the, by the tens of thousands that came in and looted and raped and kidnapped people. Um, in fact, that's one of the reasons why Hamas um, claims that they can't really account for all of the people that uh, that were kidnapped because they don't because they weren't kidnapped by Hamas. They were kidnapped kidnapped by the citizens of of Palestine. Now, based on what you experienced and learned there in Israel, how important is U.S. aid to Israel's potential success against Hamas? Yeah, I mean, Israel is an ally to the United States. We're, it's a, it's an, it's in our best interest, and I think it's the interest of humanity. You know, the, the Bible says um, when God told Abraham, He said, "You know, he who blesses you will be blessed." I think that America owes it to Israel to 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 um, to, to defend them because they defend us, um, and so and look, our support of Israel is a lot cheaper than the cost of sending an aircraft carrier over there. So it is a, it's a very, you know, and Israel doesn't need near the support as other countries do because it's a thriving economy, but um, it's a good, it's a good relationship because a lot of what Israel is purchasing is, is from the United States. It's our, it's from our military contractors in the United States, which benefits the U S as well. Now, you hinted there at the fact that there are other countries who are also facing conflicts, who are also seeking the help of the United States, that all of this is happening, of course, in a political environment this weekend. Congress and the House specifically will be taking up aid packages uh, regarding Israel and Ukraine and Taiwan. What's your perspective on the future of these aid packages? Well, I think that they're designed to pass. Um, I think the speaker has gotten the Democrats enough Democrats to to get it across the finish line. I won't be supporting it. While I w w would support aid to Israel, I've already voted for that, um, and, and would will vote for that portion of the bill again. But at the end of the day, the United States is thirty four trillion dollars in debt. We cannot afford to keep uh, bankrolling these wars all over the, all over the world. Um, as particularly when it comes to Ukraine, who is not a who's not an ally of the United States, they're not um, like like Israel is, like Taiwan is, um, and so we. Uh, I, I just don't think that uh, it's in our best interest to continue to to send a lot of the money that we're sending to Ukraine. In fact, more more than half of it is not going to to fund you know bullets and ammunitions. It's going to fund the social aspects of the Ukrainian society, which is not acceptable. Look, Ms. people in the United States, um, we need help. We have our border that's completely open on the southern border. And for months, the speaker uh, had the same views that I have still to this day, which is that we need to focus on securing our border before we're going to pay to secure the border of Ukraine. And unfortunately, he's he's changed his mind on that. Congressman, in about uh, 15 seconds, if you can, at the top of the show, we uh, showed a clip of Speaker Johnson essentially saying that if it were not for the current package being considered, a discharge position would have essentially forced the Senate version of the bill on the House. What's your reaction to that? Well, this is basically the Senate version anyway. Um, I'm not sure that there is any day, very much daylight between these two bills. Um, one of the more uh, atrocious pieces of this is that you know, the money that that was supposedly supposedly go to Taiwan, the President Biden can redirect that to Ukraine. 
uh, we're also sending nine billion dollars to Hamas. I hate so. to cut you off, but we are at a hard stop here. So I really appreciate your time. We're going to continue covering this uh, when we come back on Monday. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. And stay with us when we come back. The Biden administration has released some new revised rules regarding Title IX. We'll tell you why you should care. Welcome back to Washington Watch. I'm Joseph Backholm, sitting in for Tony today. Earlier today, the Biden administration released revised Title IX regulations. This highly anticipated rules update erodes due process for students accused of sexual assault or harassment and now includes gender identity as a protected class. With these rules taking effect August 1st of this year, what does it mean in practice for the upcoming school year? Joining me now to discuss it is Meg Kilgannon. She's the Senior Fellow for Education Studies at Family Research Council and served in the Department of Education during the Trump administration. Meg, welcome back to Washington Watch. Hi, Joseph. Your reaction to the revisions released this morning? Well, they are astounding. Uh, we knew that this was going to happen because we reviewed the the uh, rule when it was pr proposed uh, uh, in 2022. And um, there is just so much in this rule. It's about 500 pages long. It's it's really hard to describe the the results of it other than to say that they have completely demolished protections for women and this rule does actually harm students, both women especially, but also uh, male students. Um, it's it's just a disaster. Well, Meg, remind people uh, the purpose of Title IX originally to help them perhaps see the irony of what this particular revision has done with basically allowing anyone to be a woman. Well, Title IX is a little over 50 years old and it was put into place to prevent discrimination on the basis of sex in education. And at that time, the discrimination was against women. There were very few women in medical school, very few women in law school. Uh, there were very few sports programs for women that were sponsored by schools. And so they wanted to even the playing field, pun intended, I guess, <laughs> for boys and girls in schools, men and women in advanced education. So. Um, you know, the, the gains that women have made over the years as a result of this, this um, non-discrimination law have been wonderful, right? And um, this completely undermines that by including gender identity 
in the definition of sex or sex discrimination. So now a man who claims he's a woman can present himself on the women's team, in the women's locker room, in the women's dormitory, and women will not be able to object to that. There's another component of this that uh, is very concerning. Many of them are, but apparently the Biden administration is taking a position on pronouns. And they're essentially saying that uh, you must use preferred pronouns. Uh, you must uh, not what they refer to as dead name, which is referred to somebody's uh, name on their birth certificate. Uh, tell us more about that. Um, it was interesting, Joseph, there was a webinar today uh, on that topic, on, on the rule itself, right, to explain it. We had a half an hour with, uh, with the Assistant Secretary Lehman, and she uh, talked a lot about this rule. And uh, someone asked a question in that webinar about why were there weren't more protections against dead naming and why there wasn't a severe, more severe punishment for uh, not using pronouns. So there's a lot of controversy over that provision, and it, this, the... The implications of the complications of a rule like this are just incredible because it in impacts speech. It, it impacts the free yeah. and appropriate education rights. I mean, it, it impacts so many things. Well, and to that point, many states have taken a position on this question. It's very different from what the Biden administration is saying right now. And they have specifically said that uh, you that boys cannot participate on female sports teams. So given that conflict, how do you expect that self, how do you expect that to work itself out? And will the schools in one of these states uh, face uh, you know penalty from the federal government for complying with state law? Uh, well, I, I think today the the education department laid down their marker and said, yes, indeed, you will face a penalty for this. They are going to enforce this rule, and they are going to enforce it aggressively. Um, so I think what they're trying to do here, I live in Fairfax County, for example. You're from Washington State. You, we've been living under these rules for a long time, right? <laughs> Our, my county mm -hmm. adopted this several years ago. Washington State went, went down this road a long time ago. So this is designed for the red states and the red counties who have put these protections in place. This rule is coming for you. It's coming for your kids. They want to enforce this rule in your community, in your school, and on your students and on your family, and they will do it. So this is going to be the subject of lawsuits. Um, it's been, I've been talking to, to friends in this uh, space about the rule today, but it's been pretty quiet uh, because I know that the lawyers are meeting and they are planning their cases <laughs> to file their, their complaints about this rule as soon as possible. Yeah as they should be. Meg, any sense of what the penalties could be for those who dare to defy this new rule from the Biden administration? Well, you'll be losing your federal funds. Uh, you'll, be losing, you'll be losing your federal funds for your education programs in your state. Now, where I live, uh, we fund most of our education through for K-12 through our property taxes. And that's the case in many counties across the country. So it is the poorest places who will be most harmed by this because they rely the most on federal funding to bring their fund, their programs up to standard. But the, um, the implications for higher ed and colleges are significant. Well, Meg, one thing I'm sure of in all of this, despite all the questions, is that the debate is not over. You mentioned all the lawyers that are gathering. There is certain to be a lot of litigation on this question, and, and I'm confident that a lot of states are not going to just take this laying down. And of course, we got an election in November, which could change the future as well. But uh, Meg, we'll keep following it, and thanks so much for your time tonight. Thank you, Joseph. When we come back, we're going to have a worldview conversation with David Clausen and consider the question, new research begs, are Democrats better at discipling their children than Republicans are? We'll tell you more about it when we come back. Stay with us. The Lord reigns. Let America rejoice. From coast to coast, let justice reign, peace reign, righteousness reign. Lord, let it rain. May the clouds of blessings gush and rain down upon us. Yet even in the clouds, we see the light of your face. Make your face shine on these states, we pray. We pray and then we work. 
We work in the strength you provide. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Strengthen our hands to do all to God's glory. Whether we eat or drink or vote, everything is holy. So we vote to God's glory. We vote because we can. We vote because we love our nation. We vote because we love our people. The people rejoice when the righteous rule, but when the wicked rule, the people mourn. Adorn our land with oaks of righteousness. Place men, place women, place those in authority who know their place, who know that they are under authority. Men and women who will stand for the true, for the good, for a more beautiful America. But how can they stand if we don't stand? We must stand. Lift us up. Help us stand. Raise us to that summit, which is yourself. For those you raise to that summit, do not fall. You are able to keep us from falling. Until that day when we do fall, fall before your throne, where our king reigns now. Now, let us rejoice and pray, vote, stand. Amen. Jesus said in John 15, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. In 2024, in these divided and uncertain times, how can this be possible? By abiding in him through his word. At Family Research Council, we wanna help you do that, which is the reason for the Stand on the Word Bible Reading Plan. In just 10 to 15 minutes each day, you will have read the entire Bible in just two years. But more importantly, you will be abiding in him daily. Find our Bible reading plan at frc.org slash Bible. And join Tony Perkins each weekday for a 10-minute devotional inspired by the daily reading and designed to encourage you on this journey through the Bible. Listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And remember, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Washington Watch, Joseph Backholm sitting in for Tony today, taking you into the weekend. As FRC continues our Stand on the Word Bible Reading Plan, join us for the Book of Joshua and order Tony Perkins' new digital study guide, Joshua, Finish Strong. This journey through the Book of Joshua recounts how God's general successfully led Israel into the Promised Land and offers practical insight on how followers of Christ are to fight the good fight of faith. To download your digital copy today, just go online to frc.org slash Joshua or text the word Joshua to 67742. Now, the culture feels like it's changing rapidly because it is, but much cultural change is generational and it's determined by the ability or inability of one generation to pass on their values to the next generation. Well, a recent study from the Survey on American Life discovered meaningful differences in the families that pass on their values to the next generation and those that don't. And part of those differences are partisan. 62% of Americans raised by parents who consistently voted Democrat identify as Democrats today, while 57% of those who had Republican voting parents report being Republican today. Now, also interesting are the gender differences. See, young women raised in Republican households are far less likely than young men to identify as Republicans as adults. Less than half, that's 44% of young women with Republican parents report that they are Republicans, compared to two-thirds, 67% of young men. That's a huge difference. Now, why are those who vote Democrat seemingly better at passing on their values? And why are young women so much more likely to reject the values of their more conservative parents. We're going to discuss that, and joining me for the discussion is David Clausen. He's the director of the Center for Biblical Worldview at Family Research Council. David, thanks for joining me today. Hey, great to be with you again, Joseph. Well, good to have you. Uh, you know, I think we should qualify some of the terms that we're using here. This study is the one that looked at kind of the partisanship and and Democrat parents and Republican parents, and we know from a Christian worldview that the 
our goal is not to get somebody to join a political party, but we know that these lines mean something. And, and generally speaking, we're painting with a broad brush here. But what is your reaction uh, to this idea that research data is suggesting Democrats uh, today are doing a better job of passing their values onto their children uh, than Republicans are? Yeah, I think this is really fascinating uh, research, Joseph, and I'm not entirely surprised by it. I do think when you you know you dive into some of the details, you know the general trend is uh, that if your family is more politically engaged, uh, if children hear their uh, parents talk about politics at the dinner table, if they bring their kids to the polls, you know if it's a cohesive um, kind of active political family. Uh, whether that's Republican or Democrat, uh, politics is much more likely to be important uh, to the, the next generation. That was true, Republican and Democrat. But like you said, Joseph, in your opening, it, it's fascinating to see the that the difference with Democrats, uh, you know, parents who are committed Democrats, uh, to see that they're more likely to have their children follow them as far as political ideology. And when you think about this, Joseph, I'm actually not at all surprised, uh, because if you think about it, every single cultural institution in this country uh, is a cheerleader for progressive causes and for the values that are pretty much now championed uh, by the Democrat Party. And so if you, you know, these, and by the way, the survey looked at ages 18 to 29. So this would be kind of the youngest millennials and the oldest Gen Z demographics. And so, you know, if you're these young people and uh, you're hearing values that are taught at the home also reinforced online, in Hollywood, in the movies that you watch, in the music that you listen to. Uh, it's the same values that are taught in the schools that you go to. I'm not at all surprised because the values of progressive politics taught in the home by these Democrat-leaning and identifying parents are the same values now uh, that are cheerleaded, again, by almost every cultural uh, mover and shaker uh, and those who operate the levers of influence in our society. Uh, perhaps one way to look at that is the fact that progressivism seems to be the default position culturally. Is that a fair way of looking at this? That unless you are intentional about training a different worldview, that's going to be what people absorb from the world around them? I, I think so, Joseph. And again, we've talked about this on this program many times, but you know, those of us who are uh, theologically conservative Christians, uh, the, the beliefs that we hold are no longer just seen as outdated or a little old school, but increasingly they're seen as subversive and dangerous. Uh, and that we should, those of us who hold these views shouldn't even be, a, you know, it's not even polite conversation, that we shouldn't be in the public square. And so I do think that these progressive values being championed by pretty much every institution makes a study like this make sense. Now, Joseph, I do think there might be some other reasons for the gender divide uh, that we, I'm sure we can get into, but I do think this general trend where it makes it look like uh, Democrat parents are better at discipling their children, well, let's be honest, they have a lot more help uh, than conservative parents. And that, that is an interesting point, you know, but when I was looking further into this subject, um, I came across a woman named Anne Michelle who wrote a book called Handing Down the Faith. And it was a similar study, but she kind of looked at uh, not the partisan differences, and that's really what this study looked at is Democrats and Republicans, but really people who hand down their religious faith. And she looked at everything from Hindus to Mormons and everything in between. And she said uh, in talking about her study that the banner headline was that the most instrumental factor seems to be when parents talk about faith with their children, not just when they're in the car coming and going from Sunday school or when they're saying bedtime prayers, but when there's a kind of ongoing narrative just in the course of everyday life. Now, when I read that quote from her, it reminded me, of course, of Deuteronomy chapter 6. And this is Moses' exhortation to the nation of Israel about how to disciple your children. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise, right? It's this idea that discipleship happens not on Sunday morning and not during bedtime prayer, but when you demonstrate that this is an integral part of your life and that mealtime and work time and play time and you know, recreation time, all of that is uh, 
undergirded by your faith. And when you do that, that's when children really absorb this. Um, is that a fair uh, you know, take home from all of this that for parents to pass it on, they have to demonstrate that this is more than just kind of a, a, a secondary ornament in their life, but it's actually a key component of who they are. Uh, uh, Joseph, I think you just hit the nail on the head. Uh, I, I think, and you know, we've talked about you know the sixteen thousand hours uh, that students will spend in classrooms from K through twelve, and the implications that have for kindergarten. How you know one hour on a Sunday morning and a one hour on a Wednesday night youth group can't possibly counteract what you're hearing in the classroom. But I, I think you're right, right, and I think that the, the 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 passage you just hit, Deuteronomy chapter six, absolutely. I, I think Christian parents, again, reading research like this, it can be scary, uh, that can, it can be disheartening. But you, like you said, um, if Christian faith, your Christian identity really is the core of who you are, and your children know that it's the core of who you are, and it's, uh, it's part of your weekly rhythms, it's part of your regular catechesis and discipleship, um, I, I do think that's the, a big takeaway for Christian parents looking at this, that it is absolutely crucial, crucial uh, if you want your children to follow the Lord, uh, to make sure that they know without a shadow of a doubt that your commitment to Christ and to His Word and to His church is the uh, driving force in your life. And that's frankly how you demonstrate that it's not hypocrisy. Right. You may be imperfect, but it's real and it's sincere and it's an ongoing pursuit. Otherwise, if they think you're faking it, nobody is attracted in, uh, to hypocrisy. But one other element of this that I think is worth discussing is the part is, is the gender divide, excuse me, and the idea that young women are much less likely to uh, embrace the conservative value system of their parents. What do you attribute that to? Yeah, the research pointed out a couple of things, Joseph. Um, just for the sake of time, I'll mention just three of them real quick. Uh, but the, the moral revolution, uh, the LGBT identification, uh, this was really interesting. As far as Gen Z women, 33% of those who are in that youngest adult demographic identify as LGBTQ uh, compared to only 15% of Generation Z young men. Um, and of course, the LGBT uh, whole set of issues is more associated with the Democrat Party. So if you have way many, you know, a lot more women, young women identifying with LGBT at, you know, marks of identification. That makes sense why they would veer more Democrat. Uh, obviously, the, the issue of abortion looms large in this. Uh, we've seen this even before Roe v. Wade was overturned, but especially since Roe v. Wade was overturned, uh, I think the pro-abortion lobby regretfully uh, and tragically uh, has been very effective in talking about how uh, this is an assault on women's rights and women's yeah. health care. And, and so I do think a lot of young women are being, are, are hearing this abortion abortion messaging and it's being effective. And because the pro-abortion positions identified with the Democrat Party, uh, they're leaning in that direction, even if they were raised Republican. And then the one, one other statistic, Joseph, is that it appears that young women who go to college are much, even if they are raised by Republican parents, uh, they're much more likely after a four-year degree to no longer identify as Republican. It was actually 37% of college-aged women raised by Republican parents, but who go to college, um, identify as Republican, compared to 65% uh, who they still identify as Republican, uh, but they didn't go to college. So going to college uh, affects women uh, in a pretty significant way, this youngest demographic of adult women. There is a growing body of research now indicating a partisan divide between young men and young women. Young women are becoming increasingly left-wing in terms of how far out left they are and how many of them are left. And then young men are moving in the opposite direction, which uh, has concerning uh, implications for the ability to found spouses and start families in the future. But, you know, I have a 19-year-old daughter who is not particularly like, she's not a political, political activist. I asked her her impression about that information, and she said very quickly, well, progressives hate men. Why would they want to be one? Uh, and that was her just knee-jerk uh, reaction to that. And, you know, it could be true. That could be real that when men are told they're terrible all the time, it's like, well, maybe I don't want to be part of your tribe. So that could be partial explanation. But David, before I leave you today, there's one other subject I want to get into. Uh, we are going to get uh, Richard Dawkins, world famous atheist, has had some uh, really surprising things to say lately. I want to listen to that and then give you a chance to respond. 
Well, I must say, I was slightly horrified to hear that Ramadan is being promoted instead. I do think that we we are culturally a Christian country. I'm, I call myself a cultural Christian. I'm, I'm not a believer. But there's a distinction between being a believing Christian and being a cultural Christian. And so, you know, I, I love hymns and Christmas carols, and um, I, I sort of feel at home in the Christian ethos. I feel that we are a Christian country in that sense. Uh, it's true that statistically the number of people who actually believe in Christianity is going down, uh, and I, I'm happy with that. But I would not be happy if, um, for example, we lost all our cathedrals and our beautiful parish churches. Um, so I, I count myself a cultural Christian. I think it would matter if we, certainly if we substituted any alternative religion, that would be tr truly dreadful. David, a uh, world-famous atheist and kind of anti-Christian antagonist for most of his life, uh, claiming that he loves the hymns and the churches and he's a cultural Christian. What do we make of this? Yeah, a, a couple things, Joseph. It's it's so interesting. You know, Richard Dawkins wants his cake and he wants to be able to eat it too. Uh, this idea that he likes the trappings of Christianity, the cathedrals, uh, the hymns, uh, all of the the, the, the Christmas carols, um, but but he doesn't actually. He goes on in that interview to say he doesn't believe a word of Christian doctrine. So he likes the trappings of Christianity. He likes the cultural Christianity without the Christ, uh, which again that's uh, kind of <laughs> is ridiculous because you can't have one without the other, but. What's driving this, and here's the important worldview implication, uh, is that he's looking around England and seeing that Islam is taking over. I read recently that there's about 6,000 mosques right now currently under construction in Europe. And Richard Dawkins is looking at that, and what he sees in Islam is a totalizing, dominant worldview. And he understands that it's a worldview that makes theological claims, and he doesn't like it. You know, Islam itself, the, the word Islam actually means submission. It means submission to Allah. And in the Islamic worldview, uh, they believe in coercion. They believe in dominating. Uh, Muslim countries have religious police. Uh, and Richard Dawkins looks at that, and he's, I think, rightfully gets nervous where he looks at Christianity, and he realizes that, you know, the Christian worldview uh, relies on the spirit. It relies on persuasion. It's a very different worldview. And so, again, Richard Dawkins, uh, who's made a career out of that antagonizing Christian belief, I think is realizing that when Christianity is replaced by something, well, it, you know, Christianity leaves the marketplace, it'll be replaced by something. And in Europe and in England, that's increasingly uh, Islam. David, there's a lot there. It makes me wonder in part, this is an atheist claiming he's a cultural Christian. But I also think that there's a lot of cultural Christians who just haven't adm admitted the fact that they kind of live as atheists. But what he does seem to be recognizing is that not all worldviews, not all value systems are equally helpful, right? Uh, progressivism has claimed for a long time, all paths lead to God, just have good intentions. Richard Dawkins has come to terms with the fact that not all ideas have the same uh, outcomes and they're not uh, equally good in about 30 seconds. Does it give us hope if a culture generally comes to that recognition? I think it can give us hope, Joseph, because I think uh, the Christian worldview is, a, is the greatest force for good that the world's ever seen. And I think the loss of the influence of Christianity, people are going to see that. They're recognizing it. Even someone like Dawkins sees that and recognizes that. So I, I hope uh, that people will recognize that. But you can't have Christianity without Christ. Well, this, I do think, can be a good sign. Um, the, the truth always ultimately prevails, and this might just be a small victory. Uh, even if it's a very small victory, it's a real one. David Clausen, thanks for your time today. Thank you, Joseph. And friends, we thank you for joining us today on Washington Watch. Be back with you on Monday. Until then, have a blessed time with your God and your family. Fear God and nothing else. Washington Watch with Tony Perkins is brought to you by Family Research Council and is entirely listener supported. Portions of the show discussing candidates are brought to you by Family Research Council Action. For more information on anything you've heard today or to find out how you can partner with us in our ongoing efforts to promote faith, family and freedom, visit TonyPerkins.com. Also, to leave a comment about Washington Watch, call our watch line at 1-866-372-7234. That's 1-866-372-7234.